Welcome everybody to another Voices with Raveki. I'm very pleased to have James Schofield uh, on again. This is James's second time, so welcome, James. But why don't you reintroduce yourself again so that people know uh, where you're coming from? Yes, I am a philosopher. I have some analytic philosophical training, also training in anthropology, and my main focus is on anthropology or on phenomenology. And uh, uh, so I've been interested in working out something of the basic axioms that could be made for phenomenology. So phenomenology traditionally can't really posit a foundation in a uh, traditional analytic sense, but um, I I'm trying to establish something uh, in place of a foundation, a kind of basic uh, place to begin uh, a lot of investigations that might lead into replies to uh, the, the major issues in metaphysics and philosophy of science. Um, but lately I've, I've wanted to uh, transition all of that work, which initially culminated in a book, um, Dialectical Holism. Um, I, I want to uh, transfer that into some issues on um, social philosophy and ethics, uh, because I think that's really the sort of cash value of any system, is figuring out what we ought to do. And lately, there's been uh, a great deal of discussions going on concerning uh, uh, possible levels of human cognition, um, uh, a sort of developmental trajectory, uh, and of course, lots of concerns regarding politics and what sort of political system might follow from any uh, any conception of what we are as human beings. And so I'd, I'd really like to work that out. And uh, so your work has been really influential for me because it, it seemed to me that uh, the meaning crisis followed very directly from the things that I was working on in Fourier cognitive science, and uh, of course, it's it's sort of metaphysical uh, grounding. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's that's a, an initial approach. Yeah, that, that, that's wonderful. I really enjoyed our our, our last discussion a lot. Um, so maybe just I mean I have invoked it multiple times, <clears throat> but maybe a quick your take on what you mean by phenomenology, and then. Uh, you know, and then how you might see that transferring into these issues, um, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of socio-cognitive, uh, socio-political issues. Right. So the uh, so this is the tradition that uh, follows from Husserl and Heidegger uh, concerning uh, figuring out uh, the nature of our sort of existential disposition in our approach to the world. Um, what are the conditions of experiencing anything at all uh, are the, the main questions that, that we start with. And there's a series of methods that try to posit um, what the most basic uh, structures of intentionality are in, in our uh, encountering any phenomena at all. And uh, so everything in phenomenology is grounded upon of course, our embodiment, and um, this is where Fourier cognitive science has made some interesting developments, right? Uh, the, the Fourier's that have been described uh, at length uh, by, by yourself uh, yes. in, in recent videos as well. Uh, so um, the important difference, uh, as I previously mentioned, between phenomenology and other approaches to philosophy of science, uh, and this would have a great deal of implications for uh, how we talk about uh, ethics, especially, uh, is, is that uh, there's we can't posit basic particulars, right? So the first uh, point that, that I'd like to make that I think can bring us into some discussions of, of ethics uh, and, and our sort of uh, the nature of our human being um, is the eidetic um, reduction, right? So I am very much in agreement with you that um, we can't uh, establish the essence of anything, right? And, and this came out, uh, it was further developed rather by Sartre, of course, um, that uh, existence precedes essence. Um, this, uh, what I've been working on recently in order to try to get at um, some uh, lines of reasoning that could give us a sort of phenomenological uh, epistemology and then uh, phenomenological ethics uh, is the issue that, um, uh, so we, are um, a sort of, <laughs> we're, we're a kind of blind spot, we're, we're a positive of nothingness uh, in a sense, um, that uh, we begin with these constraints that are given by our bodily dynamics, um, and we uh, 
uh, encounter the world by way of our our acting, our enacting, right, and our um, embodied coupling to to what we take to be the world, and we're we're continually um, associating ourselves, identifying ourselves with things, and at the same time, uh, consciousness seems to be the function of negating those very identities, right? Um, so this then creates a very uh, troubling um, challenge in terms of how we. Uh, go about addressing uh, meaning making, right? Because meaning making needs to be connected to truth. But um, it seems that we can't clearly posit the essence of ourselves or our relationship and thus our relationship to anything at all. <laughs> um, instead, it is this continuous kind of dialectical movement of yeah. um, making meaning and then negating that meaning. Um, and uh, this is this then gives rise to all of the um, discontent and uh, uh, unease that the existentialist philosophers were, were faced with, sure. uh, right? It's a basic introduction anyway. So um, my uh, so my initial um, uh, uh, move then here would be to say that, uh, um, right, so we can't individuate ourselves. So, so individuation becomes a, a really important um, point to make, and and it hasn't been. I don't think uh, maybe maybe you've seen some philosophers mention this, but but I don't think that it's been uh, discussed this way. Like individuation is discussed more in um, traditional metaphysics and epistemology, yeah. but in yeah. phenomenology, it isn't really addressed. And it seems though that it's at the very core of the phenomenological method is um, trying to go about uh, carving out the world and understanding our relationship to it while lacking traditional uh, uh, uses of individuation, right? So, so then we need to do something else. Um, and uh, the, the next step, the next point or issue here is that uh, our, um, uh, our ethics or what we ought to do seems to be interdependent with um, uh, how we go about establishing or knowing truth, right? Each seems to presuppose the other. Um, because we uh, we can't really have a clear sense of what we ought to do uh, without a sense of truth, and we can't establish a sense of uh, truth without a, a procedure um, that is uh, that, that tells us why truth is actually a good thing to aim for and right. what it isn't how to go about getting it. Right. So that's that's just my initial approach, right? And it, it seems my intuition, and I'd like to kind of put this to you for possible clarification and development. <laughs> uh, this is what I've come to lately um, because I'm having to um, run a course on existentialism. So all my thoughts are, are geared right, to this right. issue. Um, uh, with that interdependent sort of co-arising of ethics and epistemology, it seems to me that um, we might establish a sort of uh, beginning um, framework for dealing with both of those. And then that could give us a sense of how we ought to go about relating to each other, right? And, and I think your work has already spoken to this, but this is just yeah. my approach to the issues, right? Yeah, very much. That was that was very clear, James, thank you. Um, um, yeah, uh, so, being very deeply influenced right now by a bunch of people, especially DC Schindler and his book on Plato's critique of pure reason, love in the postmodern predicament, the Catholicity of reason. Um, and he's basic, and then also Clark, Clark's work uh, on St. Thomas uh, on Aquinas. And, and, I, and I, I'm agreeing with the current scholarship that Aquinas is not primarily an Aristotelian. The current uh, scholarship is that Aquinas is somebody who uses Aristotle in the service of Neoplatonism. And so mm -hmm. the, 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 a, the ancient analog for Aquinas is not Aristotle, it's Plotinus. Um, and what all, what all that is, is just the idea, because it was something that gets developed in Neoplatonism, um, about, the, about the interpenetration of what are called the three transcendentals, the true, the good, and the beautiful. And I, I, so one of the things I want to talk to you about is uh, what about the third normative dimension, um, right? Um, there's the true for epistemic, there's the good for action, and then there's the beautiful uh, for, for perception. Um, and, um, and given for e-cognitive science, talking about how, all, how massively interdependent those are, that's at least a preliminary reason for considering that the 
the three transcendentals. They're called the transcendentals, by the way, because they're supposed to be, as you said, they're supposed to be sort of universal in our phenomenological uh, intentionality, our, our phenomenal, phenomenological connectedness and directedness towards all of reality. So in every mm -hmm. being and, and, and in being itself, we are, all, we are always sort of constrained and lined by you know, these three dimensions of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Um, so um, I think that that's right. There's something about, um, what, how does Schindler uh, put it? He says, the beauty is primary, uh, good, is, good is central, and truth is, uh, truth is ultimate, something like that. Uh, they're, they're all sort of superlative, but in slightly different ways. Mm. And one of the things I've been doing is, um asking people like, like the, the question that you like wh why do you find truth good right mm -hmm. and, and what's the connection between it and then not only that why do you find it good but how did it attract you uh which is has to do with the beautiful uh because i'm concerned also as you know with relevance realization why does something become salient to us is not the same as why do we find it good and right and, and which is not the same as why do we find it real but they're all interrelated in this powerful way mm -hmm. so my thinking is very much about um trying to get that phenomenological interdependence clearer and then how that ramifies into our notion of reason and what it is to reason because we have become focused on reason as directed just to truth as if truth right uh, is sort of completely self-determining uh, you know habermas talked about how we treat these three as if they're autonomous uh, and that has been one of the big problems of modernity uh, but if we think of reason as having to do with the true the good and the beautiful and especially of their interdependence then we are going to shift our conception of reason off of just the obtaining of true beliefs, we're gonna shift it into you know, virtuous actions and we're gonna shift it also into beautiful experience, beautiful sensory motor. Uh, uh, and, and then that's a very interesting thing to pursue. Um, then, right, what, that's, what does that mean for science and ethics and art? So that's exactly what I'm exploring right now. And it sounds like it's very, very much overlapping with your explorations. Yes, uh, I think so. Uh, it, it seems to me, this is really just an intuition at this point, that um, the kind of approach that uh, phenomenology can be developed into and the kind of work that you're doing seems to suggest that there would be a convergence of different uh, ethical approaches. Like, um, for instance, the utilitarian positive maximizing uh, so, something um, that the good right that yeah. that good would then be uh, convergent it seems with um, with a particular definition of truth and yes. and that can be cashed out in terms of the conditions of establishing truth right and and then you get a, a richer ethics by saying um, this is how we ought to interact with each other in order to sort of maximize our obtaining of truth and our, our clarification then of our relationship to the world so it's um, it's very much a trajectory of um, of sort of self correction. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> iterated yes. self corrections that, that we yes. end up uh, hashing out here. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think <clears throat> I, I, I and I, and I would I am I am trying to argue for self correction and self transcendence because they're interdefining uh, uh, as the essential feature uh, of. Of, of reason, of, of rationality, uh, that uh, what, we, what we're talking about is the, when we're talking about becoming people aspiring to, it's not only that aspiration is rational, it's that rationality is inherently aspirational uh, because uh, uh, insofar as I am engaged in a project of self-correction, right? I'm engaged in a project of self-transcendence and then I'm in the paradox of that, I'm somehow right i'm somehow othering myself to become myself it, it, I, I, rationality and aspiration aren't aren't like this it's not the only that aspiration is rational it's that rationality is inherently aspirational um and, and so i'm trying to get people to realize that 
Um, one way of thinking about it, it, it is that, like about, about that it, it is, think about how, right, we're playing with these related notions of realness, something to do with truth, and then realizing it, that that's like in the sense of sort of knowing, and, but then, you know, self-realization, which is right very much the good um, in an important way. Because, because we have tended to ultimately, I think one of the points of convergence is around, right, the connection between uh, goodness and something about, um, how do I want to put it? You know, self-realization, self-actualization. I don't want. I'm not. I don't mean just in Maslow's sense, or even in Aristotle's sense. I mean, there's a that happiness is a deep kind of self-correction, self-transcendence, self-realization, and knowledge is a deep kind of self-correction, self-transcendence, self-realization. That's mm -hmm. that's what, and they end up. Both of those are aspirational projects in a deep way. But mm -hmm. and this is where I, I would bring in a sort of. A, not just DC Schindler, but some of my own work, all of that is always taking place within relevance realization because we are finite beings. Our transcendence is always fine. So beauty, the, the proper proportioning of salience is integral to both of those aspirational projects of epistemic and ethical self, uh, 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 ethical realization. Did that make any sense at all at what I was trying oh, to yes, get at? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that it did. That does seem to uh, reflect a, a lot of... Uh, the concerns that I have. So um, I think I might be missing a step here, but it seems like the next step, and, and this is where I thought it would lead, is sort of positing um, uh, some sort of structural trajectory of, of what that looks like, right? That, yes. That's the very next thing that needs to be yes. done is to say, okay, yes. if that is our <clears throat> existential disposition is to yes. be encountering this kind of uh, process, this sort of dynamical, um, uh, self-reflective, self-transcending uh, yeah. attempt to uh, bring about uh, increasingly clarified uh, ways of approaching what is relevant and um, yeah. what is yeah. good and what is true. Um, well, what is the trajectory that makes us <laughs> bring about more truth and more goodness, right? Yes. Um, than where we are right now, right? And, and then we bump up against a lot of the discussions that have been going on lately concerning stage theories um, yes. and uh, the, the different theories that are on offer um, concerning them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so um, sort Excellent. of, um, right. So a first thought toward that end is, is um, uh, so maybe we'll be headed in that direction, but I think that this is, this is just something to bear in mind that has been on my mind lately. Please. It's the uh, possible um, uh, polarity between uh, different methods within a phenomenological space that are, uh, they're, they're polar opposites, right? And, and maybe this is um, incredibly crude, but it's like a first step, uh, yes. is the, the paranoid critical method on the one side, which is essentially um, Dali's surrealism, yeah, 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 yeah. an ongoing elaboration of associations um, in oneself. And it seems when you are too uh, realist about that, you end up in something like a dogmatism. And yeah. um, uh, on the other end, something like Vipassana, uh, yeah, yeah. the continuous um, flowing through such associations without grabbing onto any of them. And if you're too yeah. kind of dogmatic about that, you end up in something like nihilism. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it seems that uh, if we are to posit a trajectory with any kind of rigor, it would be some sort of balance between the two, like the conditions under which um, we uh, we let go in the conditions under which we um, grab onto and run with our associations um, in the hope of bringing about more meaning yeah. into our lives and and, yeah. and of course that's the um, uh, that's the sort of internal um, exploration is is working out the balance between the two of those um, but then there's another uh, dimension another vector on that space it seems that is the way we relate to other people the way other people uh, question criticize, um, interject uh, and, and, and help clarify what we believe is the case about ourselves and our, our current situation in our movement. So um, we are also relating to the perspectives of others and we need to say something about the conditions in which we integrate versus resist yep, um, yep. their perspectives uh, with regard for what we find uh, in that initial um, uh, polarized spectrum. That's good. Um, I like, 
I like that, um, the, the polarity. I, yeah, so I suspect um, when it's functional, we have something like opponent processing rather than just, uh, uh, just dichotomy or opposition that they, mm -hmm. uh, they, re they, they reflect um, uh, uh, like they're put, they're in a, uh, they're bound together in a relationship of mutual self-correction and self-affordance. Um, so one way, maybe this maps. One way I've been trying to understand this, because the, the pursuit of the trajectory is, you know, a name we've given that traditionally is wisdom. Like we're trying to find the, how do I, how do I, how do I find the trajectory, right? And that's sort of a, the epitome of the wise person. But you, what I've noticed is that that different wisdom traditions put different priorities on these various poles that like that you're talking about. Uh, I thought about it slightly differently, and now we'll see if this matches up because I think it does to a certain degree. So there's one, like you said, where you're opening up, right? A a you've got association and image, like Dali does, and you get surrealism, um, and, and surrealism really lines up very well with uh, you know. With Corbin, I think with Corbin's notion of the imaginal, um, and the the point of the imaginal is not imagination that distracts us from our engagement with the world, but the point is the imaginal is supposed to be for the sake of perception. So, for example, when I'm doing Tai Chi Chuan, I'm doing all kinds of I'm using all kinds of imagery, but I'm not off in a fantastical world. I'm doing that so I can enhance. I'm using sort of predictive processing ideas. I can enhance my perception of the world. So it's more like I'm pretending than I'm forming mental images, right? Uh, and the thing about the, the, the problem that the surrealists uh, uh, fell into, I would argue, I mean, this is an existential critique. This is the critique that the existentialists made of them is they didn't have anything to confront the Nazis. Whereas the existentialists said, no, no, we have a frame, like we're engaged with the world. So to put a label on it, uh, that's a pretty good psychological label. One of the dangers with the imaginal is it can become spiritual bypassing. You can get disconnected. And I think that's what you're sort of alluding to. And then you point to this other thing where, right, moving into non-conceptual space, non-imagery, non-conceptual space, no, no pictures, no propositions. Like I, I regularly have people who, like are almost like filled with missionary zeals. John, if you could just get into non-conceptual non-duality, you would see that as the answer. And, you know, and I've experienced this <clears throat> and I've read, uh, you know, I've read Nargajuna and Plotinus, and I've read them, I've studied them, I've not just read them and I, I get that. Um, and Plotinus was worried about this himself. Uh, Chris and I wrote about this, right? It, you, you have to like, you get to this place where you're, like you said, where you, you, you face this really difficult and it's phenomenologically difficult problem of this non-being. What's the difference between, as Plotinus put it, what's the, what's the difference between the non-being of nihilism, the privative non-being and the non-being, uh, right? Uh, uh, the superlative non-being, the trans-conceptual, the one, the, right? And, and God, if you want to, right? And, and like that requires, um, a lot. Now, what one thing I would want to put in there is also, um, well, I want I want to put in the interpersonal like you did, but I I I think of about a fourth one, which is uh, wisdom traditions that, right? You can emphasize the dialogical, Platonic, right? The Platonic tradition. Uh, you can emphasize the non-conceptual, the Neoplatonic tradition, various mystical tradition. You can you can emphasize the imaginal. Jung is a clear example of a spirituality wisdom tradition built around that. But there are also traditions, and this is where I'm thinking of Taoism, although it has a bit of this, where the sensory motor domain is emphasized, where that is really emphasized, where what I'm doing is my dynamic, you know, embodied coupling to the world and flow states and things like that. Now, the problem with that, right, is, right, is that that, of course, can get hijacked. You want to get flow states that germinate, that generalize and generate. Let me give you a clear example. For me, Tai Chi Chuan has been great because it permeates my life and percolates my psyche. But people can get into flow states, in some, some people in some video games, and it doesn't do that. It locks them in 
and it disconnects them in a powerful way because they haven't properly got the sensory motor machinery engaged. So I would, I would put to you that there's four, uh, at least that I'm, uh, I see, uh, places where different wisdom traditions put different emphases on different dimensions of our phenomenology in order to say, there's where you will find the trajectory to wisdom. How does that strike you? Right. So again, uh, it, it seems to me that when we sort of um, spell out the, the space of our phenomenological disposition and we get these different vectors, yeah, right? yeah. Uh, my intuition is that just having uh, the, um, the, the sort of conditions by which there are these um, dynamic co-emergences of the, yeah. the different domains that we are trying to interface with that in itself kind of gives us the trajectory and interestingly though um that seems to end up sounding a bit like a natural law theory and and that's another issue i wanted to put to you is because we end up saying and so this comes back to a, a different issue that i was going to mention in the beginning um so <clears throat> the the suspension of the natural attitude in phenomenology right sure. that, it, it, this is the way I've understood um, the, the developments of phenomenology through Merleau-Ponty is that um, by talking about uh, the, the conditions or the constraints of our body, what we're doing is like we're, we're sort of bringing back a little bit um, some sedimented layers of a natural attitude. And, and it gets um, very explicitly developed, I think, by Sean Gallagher in his front loading yep. phenomenology, yeah, 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 because yeah. he's explicitly positing the feedback loop between um, the the sort of things that we come to in our phenomenological experiences, the the structures and constraints, and then using them to inform our next phenomenological investigations. Um, so when we end up with some conditions and constraints that are invariant, right, across lots of different situations and people, at least for respective domains or things, topics that we're interested in. Um, it seems to me that we've already begun to sediment a kind of natural attitude insofar as we are um, using that at all yeah. um, to do more phenomenology. Um, I, I, I'm curious to know if that, uh, yeah. if you would interpret it differently or, but, but the further, um, uh, implication of all this, if taken as far as it could possibly go, is that you end up with these um, basic structures more than embodiment. You know, lots, let's just say that this process continues for hundreds of years. Yeah. You end up with a, a series of structures that um, are, in a pragmatic sense, we take them to be ontological uh, because they don't seem to vary. <laughs> And they seem to be very um, stable and predictable. And, uh, and then we're deriving from them conceptions of, um, uh, of like what we should do and, um, and the nature of truth, right? And, and it seems to yeah. me that that's something similar to a natural law theory, but altered very significantly because nature is, is altered in, in this line of reasoning. How does that? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, th I think that's very well said. I can't remember the title of the book. I got this book on integrating phenomenology and naturalism uh, in some fashion. And uh, and you put your finger on handbook? something. I, I, I have a handbook I want to read that's on phenomenology and naturalism. I'm not sure if that's the one you're referring no, to. I forget who wrote it though. No, it's not a handbook. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like it's an argumentative theoretical philosophical text. Mm. Uh, I'll try to remember it and put it in the notes for... Mm. Uh, but I haven't read it. I've just got it because of this issue. This is this is <clears throat> this is like this is uh, uh, like a, a touchstone issue, I think, for four E cognitive science uh, because mm -hmm. it's you know deeply influenced by 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 by, by, by Marlo Ponti. But of course, it also wants to take up uh, the you know the practice of science, and um, <clears throat> and I think that's right. And, and for me, well, first of all, in terms of the philosophical heritage. That's why I ultimately have a preference for stoicism over existentialism, um, because, um, you know, I agree with Taylor and the reading on Heidegger, you know, that what 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 comes out, you know, and um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I agree. I, I'm, I'm very critical of Sartre. I'm not sure I agree with Sartre's take on it. Right. Especially in being a nothingness. But this idea, I like Taylor's take on it better, I guess what I'm saying that you know we in some sense don't fall cleanly into any scientific worldview because unlike other things we are self-defining right in the way that the existentialists highlighted and and the stoics actually talk very significantly about that and there's important connections there but the stoics also 
um, right, <clears throat> emphasize uh, something that, for example, Heidegger emphasizes, we're mortal. And we can't self-define that away. We can, we can do a lot of stuff about it. Mean, but this is a hard constraint uh, for our existence. Uh, and, and Marla Ponti, you know, we're embodied and that's a hard constraint. Uh, for example, and uh, uh, Verveke would argue we're, we're, we, are, we, are, we are absolutely bound to relevance realization for our cognition and things like that. Um, so I guess in what I would say is um, insofar as the phenomenology reveals these constraints, and this is part of the battle between Marlo Ponti and Sartre, right, is you move away from a purely existential um, interpretation of the phenomenology. And you start to, right, you, you start to posit, and this is one of the things that I think is coming to the fore in the four ecog side. And, and you see Marlo Ponti, Dan Chappie and I are reading Lowe's book. Um, Lowe is trying to complete, like he's using Marlo Ponti's lectures and stuff. He's trying to complete what, what the argument of the visible and the invisible is. And you see Marlo Ponti moving towards this, and he's he's moving more and more towards um, the idea that our self-defining uh, is intermeshed, the chiasm, as he often puts it, with the self-defining na uh, the self-defining nature of nature. Nature is also a self-defining thing, and our self-defining and its self-defining affords a mutual indwelling, which is not homogeneous. It's not an identification but they are bound together. And that for me um, is sort of where I feel my ontological position is going. Now, I wonder if that's natural law or if that's something other because natural law seems to, at least the versions I'm familiar with seem to have it as, you know, there in, in some fashion. You know, right, right. That, right. That's right. the key difference, I think. Yeah, yeah. Is that, exactly. is that this is very dynamical and ongoing. And e yeah. even instead of positing structures, right, there's constraints to yes, a dynamical trajectory. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it still, I think, um, has a deep resemblance to the logic of a natural law right. deduction for our epistemology. I, I for, agree. And, and Schindler, yeah. Schindler brings that out. In fact, he argues that when you when you sort of, and I can't do the whole argument here, but so I'm going to just gesture out. But he argues that when you're pushing at truth and you're pushing at realness, you're pushing at the fact, right, that reality has a for itselfness, like mm -hmm. we have a for ourselfness, and, and those and those have to you know properly respond to each other. Um, and, and in this way, you know, he's. You, we're trying to get beyond either empiricism or romanticism in, uh, in our fundamental epistemology. Yeah, I, I guess it's, it's yeah, it's, it, this is exactly the tricky thing. You're really making, I, I'm really enjoying this. You're really making me step back and slow down and think about this, right? And, and I've been playing a lot with this about, and, and uh, who was I reading about this? Uh, this notion of inventio, right? That it's, it's uh, Kerry used it in his book on uh, Augustine, but it, the Latin term, me, it, it, it hangs between discover and make. And, and the idea that, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and Polanyi was about this too. He doesn't use the word inventio, but <clears throat> he, he, he said the paradox of that, we seem to generate standards that we then, that we then find ourselves bound to. We, seem, we think we're making them, and yet we find that we were always constituted by being bound to them and we get we get this thing and it's like we have the, this inventio we're making as we discover and we're discovering as we making as we're making mm -hmm. and, and i think i mean you acknowledge it but i think that is a very significant novelty i think that uh, and, and i like uh, plan was really really wrestling with it in, in his work because he was trying to get that 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 inventio towards the inexhaustibleness of reality is our primary way of tracking the true, the good, and the beautiful to get back to our trajectory thing. Uh, I think I, that Varela uh, was referring to that uh, when he talked about walking the razor's edge. 
he, he yes. might have been meaning something else, but I, I think that's how I've always interpreted it. Um, it. And it's very, very difficult because it's so incredibly easy to sort of collapse into uh, a rigid metaphysical answer or some sort of yep. Um, yep. Uh, solid ontology of some kind. But but this is an ongoing process and, and it's, um, it's endlessly challenging and um, I think frustrating to try to make sense of what exactly is meant by constructivist because yeah. of course the, the four ECOG side people um, and phenomenologists are invoking something like um, a constructivism here, but exactly to what extent uh, we are constructing what it no, 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 that's, that's to good. be spelled out. Be because it's, a, it, it's, you see, because it's a, it, it's a weird, Kind of constructivism. I mean, if you take certain people uh, at the core, I mean, there's deep connections between. Well, oh, let's let, let, let me try it this way. A lot of constructivism is bound to a kind of nominalism. It's bound to the idea that well, there's no real patterns, and I impose them on the world. And you know, and for all of his nuances, Kant is sort of like you know uh, uh, <laughs> the epitome of that or the culmination of that. I, again, there's a lot going on in Kant, but Right. The, the problem that the, the problem with that, of course, is, you know, well, two things. How, how does the mind know its meaning? Like, is that also constructed? And then you get the infinite regress. So the constructivist has to has to sneak in direct knowing of some point. And then also, right, if there aren't any real relations, what's the through line? What's the continuity of the knower of the mind that's doing the construction? Surely it has real power. So it's not only it has right direct knowing and real. So you, you end up denying uh, to the mind the very thing you're positing about reality. And you get, like you said, you get the nothingness and you get this deep duality. And so what I would say is, and whether or not they're succeeding is, is uh, like a legitimate question. But the, the, the phenomenologist for e-cognitive science constructivism is a constructivism that is is deeply rejecting that dualism and deeply rejecting <coughs> the nominalism and you know that we're cut off from the thing in itself and all these kinds of severance moves all these dualities and severance moves i mean that's really clear in marlo ponti right he keeps whenever that comes up you know no and he like and he tries to take it apart and he tries to take it apart so again it it, it I, I, I i i i guess i'm posing to you a question it seems to me that the constructivism is really not constructivism, like the natural law really isn't a, a typical natural law. It's it's like it, but it, there's a significant novelty in there in some fashion. Right. Well, so, uh, so this creates a opposition to uh, a lot of folks who um, have been advocating for a, a Gibsonian um, approach to um, affordances, like <clears throat> just for one example, right? This, there's a lot of tensions that can result because even within theory cognitive science, I think that uh, there's a lot of different positions that have tried to maintain a, a direct realism of some kind. Yep. Um, and what it is that they're directly aware of uh, seems to me to be very unclear. And for all yep. the um, uh, virtues of Anthony Chimero, um, and his work uh, and, and Michael Silberstein, like they, yeah. uh, it, it seems that there's a problem in, in their conception of realism uh, or, or what, what it is we're directly encountering, yeah. right? It's, it's um, I, I guess that there's, there's really no way to tease apart what it is that we're saying that is real and what it is that we're saying that is uh, constructed. Instead, it's just, um, we, we can talk about the constraints of our uh, encountering or enacting something, and then we talk about the process by which that takes place. And that process, though, <clears throat> this is the important bit, is that it can't be sort of decoupled from the world's process of, of coming to be. Um, well, it, yeah. So our cognition, um, this comes back to my uh, uh, kind of somewhat long, long standing line of argument, is that a proper conception of evolution, even going back through cosmology, um, is connected to a proper conception of cognition. That, um, yeah. that for what seems to me to be the best line of reasoning for phenomenology and in activism, um, you literally can't take those two things apart. Uh, there's, there's no way because once you start talking about like 
our process is in any sense differentiated from the world or doing the constructing, you, you collapse into some kind of dualism or essentialism. And, and if you try to go the other way and try to talk about what the world is, um, what that process is sort of independent of us, um, you end up excluding uh, consciousness from that that framework. And, and that's like not allowed <laughs> given a phenomenological approach. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So what do you think then of Marlo Ponti's proposal, right? That um, the dehiscence of the body, the doubleness, one, the oneness doubleness of the body, which is not a duality, right? That, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, yeah. um, uh, the lived in the living body. Yeah. Uh, it's, or you can get it in, in the sense that, um, you know, I, my body both I, I, touches and is touched, mm -hmm. right? And that's, uh, and so there's a sense in which any, any, any constraints I posit for myself transfer to the world because my body is a, a body amongst other bodies, mm -hmm. the body in that sense. Right. But right. Like you said, if I just, if I just treat it that way, I lose the, that that's just how my body touches the world, but it, mm -hmm. but I lose the fact that in, in, whenever I'm touching any object and Polanyi does a good job about this and Meek puts them together, whenever I'm touching an object, I'm also, also in, at least in a subsidiary fashion, touching myself. Right. And, and those two are, 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 are bound together in a particular way. So I, I, what, I, what I mean is embodiment is, is, is an attempt to try and address that. Now, I, I want to immediately say, and perhaps this is your point, I don't think that's still, I, I, I think that's beautiful, but I don't think it, ult I mean, as in, you know, how do we do it, so to speak? Mm -hmm. The psychological cognitive question, I think, is addressed well. But and given your previous point, this 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 is an important point. I, I do see what you say, right? There's there's the like, what's the what's the uh, what what's what's the ontological relations that are ultimately being like? If we do, what is it, Uxfeld and, and the uh, and the Umwelt, right? The lived world, right? Is do mm -hmm. do presumably the lived world is not the only world because we we can move from one lived world to another, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Right? So there's a yeah. space in which there's a space other than lived worlds in which lived worlds, you know, uh, uh, can be individuated or transformed or moved between. I, I, I don't know which metaphor you want to use there, but the point is, we the the very disclosure of an umwelt and, and its dynamics seems to disclose something outside of the umwelt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and I sometimes feel a deep tension within four ecogsi between ontologies that want to say there's nothing but the umwelt and ontologies that want to say, no, no, there's, 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 there's an independent world, right? Because they want to get, they want to get, they, they want to get, because I think we're approaching a paradox in which I want to say, I think both things are true, <clears throat> that meaning is co-constructed by me and the world. I don't do we meaning, and I'm not a blank slate, and the world's not an empty canvas, right? I think that's right. But then, and then if intelligibility and meaning and being are bound together, we're tempted to say that being is co-constructed by the world and us, and then that just makes no sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so I feel that tension. I, is this close to what? Oh, yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, so, very much. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of problems that I've seen, I'm trying to think of how to say this <laughs> in a diplomatic way. <clears throat> There's some problems lately in various philosophical publications that um, take, I think, too seriously the the life world that we're in and culture and and its impact on us and um, its reality, right? So our <clears throat> it it should be said that <clears throat> our knowing ourselves depends upon our positing some other perspective that's outside of us. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, doing so, though, immediately gives us the opportunity to say that um, not just a perspective within our uh, our culture or our life world, but there could be one outside of it. Like yeah. this inference is, is automatic, it seems, for any conscious human being. Um, and that effectively sort of logically negates the life world that we're in as being ultimate. So you end up with a world horizon, I, I believe it would be called in, in yep. phenomenology so yep. um or the, the horizon of all world horizons and and it's from that vantage point that you're positing the possibility 
of some other perspective, exactly. um, even beyond yeah. the immediate yeah. ones that we're encountering that allow us to know ourselves. It's it, it, so this horizon of all world horizons is what allows us to negate all cultural associations. And it, it seems to me that this also um, provides us the, uh, the a sort of framework for um, uh, infinite orders of intentionality, which then becomes God. <laughs> Uh, it, it, and, and it's from that vantage point that we're um, trying to posit the, um, the the limited truth that our modes yeah. of engaging in culture and using cultural structures gives us some some uh, yeah, limited truth. Yeah. Uh, uh, so right. So that gives us. Um, it seems to be like a possibility of using a conception of God uh, as that's showing up um, in our uh, yeah. philosophical, you know. Um, I think that's right. I mean, I think that's right. And, and I, I mean, and I don't mean this as any kind of uh, criticism. I, I, that's a kind of Neoplatonic argument. The, the Neoplatonic mm -hmm. argument is that, right, you don't just pay attention to sort of your phenomenology, you pay attention to the structures of your intelligibility. Mm -hmm. and, and you're trying to trade back and forth between them. And you just did that, right? It's, right? Yeah, yeah, here's the phenomenology, but something there's something outside the phenomenology that makes the makes the very possibility of the intelligibility of the phenomenology, right? That kind of that it's not it's not it's yeah, not exactly. sui generis, right? Yeah. And, and, and you make that kind of argument, and that's exactly what the you know you've got things, and then you've got you know you have to mm -hmm. keep positing these larger and larger frames of intelligibility mm -hmm. until you get to the frame of the frames of all the you get the one, right? So uh, it, it just just as like an aside, I think this is um, this does speak to some possible um, problems that have arisen in some discussions, peripheral discussions, and also in like transpersonal psychology, um, yeah. certain iterations of it, where <clears throat> I think that the tendency has been to like um, try to live there in the context, and um, the the problem is that you end up. Uh, not being as embodied or not really as engaging with the yep. world and not taking seriously the the actual limitations of your knowledge and and so you can't really push those limitations um, you have to sort of bump up against uh, your own um, uh, personal uh, existential uh, cognitive uh, limitations in order to understand what those limits are and to, to go a bit further and you you can um, uh, th so this is all to say that I think um, the 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 ultimate sort of world horizon right in a way it's it's quite empty <laughs> and so we can't live there and we can't ever reach it <laughs> and um there's a lot of problems that can result philosophically and and cognitively when we, we try to think that we have achieved it or that like there's yeah. just one way to get to it or that we understand that <clears throat> that vantage point <clears throat> this is for me why especially <clears throat> well you know howland's not howland highland's work on Plato and finite transcendence, uh, but also some really good work uh, within the Christian Platonist tradition, because one of the things that Christianity did when it merged with, I'm not advocating for it, I'm just using it as a template, right? Uh, uh, I'm not denying it either, that's not my place, uh, right? Uh, one of the things it did is it tried to, it tried to bring in humility, uh, you know, love and logos together. What I mean by that is, um, you need the horizon, um, and I, I would put it to you that it, the horizon qua horizon is empty, but the horizon as it functions as a horizon isn't empty, because what it does <laughs> is it gives you, you know, using the metaphor, it gives you the, a field of trajectory, an orientation, so that you can track the true, the good, and the beautiful, like we were talking about earlier, and so um, insofar as it functions, it has a presence yeah. And you can see, and you can see, you know, uh, the, the cataphatic and the apophatic relationship to God as trying to get that. No, no, we walk the path, but we always, we're always aware of the fact that it transcends us, but it's imminent and it's like, and you get all of that. And what, what I'm trying to say here is the, 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 the answer, I'm putting in scare quotes, the answer isn't like a conclusion. It isn't I'm there, right? Or I should just stay here, right? The answer is to put those two into right relationship. It's to put mm -hmm. the fact that I am inescapably finite into right relationship uh, to that which 
transcends and by transcending grounds, right, all of my possible experience and sense making. And, and for me, and, and this will raise some hackles for some people, this is, this is ultimately a spiritual when it's individual and religious when it's a collective project, because it's about right relationship, right self-understanding, and, and, and right community with others, because, right, you said it, I can't, like, I couldn't get to the sense of the world horizon unless I indwell your perspective on my perspective and allow you to indwell mine. I mean, this is Vygotsky. I can't, I can't do any of that. On, on, I, I, it depends on interpersonal, interperspectival, mutual indwelling, right? And then you and I can only do that within a community, within a history, within a culture, blah, 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 right? <laughs> and so I think any attempt, so wow, this is going to sound really overconfident. I'm coming to the conclusion, I, I'm arguing now that any attempt to, to, to situate and identify with either one of these poles is a fundamental mistake, but it's it, it, it like, no, no, I just stay within the Umwelt, right? Well, no, no, I, I've achieved one with oneness with the absolute or something. I think I think those are fundam fundamentally undermining of our attempts to come into relationship with what's true, good, and beautiful. Mm. Um, and, and so um, for me, and this is where Kierkegaard is helpful, figuring out the right relationship, and, and that doesn't mean having an idea, it means crafting existential modes that comport me in the best possible way towards what we've been talking about is sort of the central existential task. Mm -hmm. Yep. We need a culture, we need a community in order to be and become and thrive. Uh, but that community hopefully is oriented toward a trajectory of its own self-transcendence. Exactly. The thriving of its members. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's so in a very abstract sense, that's uh, what I've been trying to um, clarify lately. And, and that leads us to, I think, a, uh, a proper ethics and also um, a kind of political philosophy for how that community, those communities might be organized that could facilitate this. And of course, I think you'd agree that the answer is um, infinite, like there's, there's infinite ways to go about doing this. But yep. at the same time, there's going to be homologies, I think, between them, uh, insofar as there is a uh, some sense of what uh, human being and human thriving looks like in a, in a universal sense, yeah. which I, I do believe that there is, uh, and it's just that we have to sort of learn what those limits are. So <clears throat> one of my um, starting points for all of this, of course, this is like reminiscence of uh, existence precedes essence ideas that we should be interested in establishing the conditions that could allow us to um, uh, sort of explicate what the definition of being human is, because yeah. we haven't got it yet. And, uh, and probably we never will insofar as humans continue to live. Yeah. Uh, and, and that I think is really important again for um, this first step toward establishing what kind of uh, political organization we might have on any scale of, of a community yeah. um, is that we don't even know what we are. So we can't do the traditional line of reasoning that starts with some conception of how we uh, are and how we think and how we operate and then derive from that something of um, how we should best be in, in a community. The, the whole point is that we're, we're trying to um, uh, continually figure this out by relating to each other. And then, so the question is, what, uh, under what conditions could we relate to each other in, in a way that would bring about uh, ongoing clarification to this question? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and you, you see, I mean, so Habermas tries to do that in one way. He 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 sort of says, well, the core of what we're trying to do is communication and communicative action. And then what are the what are the constitutive principles of communicative action? Um, I think that's good, but I, I don't think it's like sufficient. Uh, uh, I, I I think communicative action and meaning making and uh, and sense making and right and, and also uh, you know uh, coordinated labor there, there's all kinds of stuff that has to be brought into this um, 
Yeah, I, I again, I keep I keep bumping up against this because I I I let me give you an example uh, of what uh, a proposal for exactly that. <clears throat> so I think one of the things we should advocate for is the idea that we are both flawed and self-deceptive and that we should use a kind of opponent processing, mm -hmm. right? And that means a, a, a particular vision of democracy in which the process of opponent processing always takes priority over your position or my position, right? And that what we have is the loss of the opponent processing within democracies, especially, I guess, right now, the United States. It, and it's been replaced with an adversarial zero-sum game, winner-take-all approach. Um, mm -hmm. So much so that it's not clear why either party wants to be in power other than to be in power and prevent the other party from being in power, right? Um, and, and it's having disastrous, and I would say it's having disastrous consequences for the United States. So <laughs> that's what I mean about um, right, right. how, but for me, it, I would say that's sort of getting at trying to get at sort of the cultural, uh, the cultural framework within which any political action has to take place. Because, for example, if you're locked into a adversarial zero sum gain way of being, right, right. Any pol I don't care what policies you make. You can even make policies that might be good for people, but the way you're making them ultimately <laughs> undermines, yeah, right. Yeah. The, the process of self-correction. Um, mm -hmm. One of the one of the great things I'm afraid of right now, and so I'm just giving this as a related proposal. I'm 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 worried about the fact that we are allowing our visions of substantive justice to completely erode our commitment to procedural justice. We're like, you know, they're evil, we're good, and mm -hmm. you know, we're going to crush them, and so we give up the commitment to opponent processing because we're so convinced we have. The pure vision right mm -hmm. um and, and go ahead go ahead well yeah i was just thinking that uh, both parties assume that their cultural vantage points um provide a sufficient conception of what is needed for a human to thrive. exactly right. exactly and and it's like isn't that just red like when you stand back and just say that plainly like mm -hmm. you just did isn't it just it's just a ridiculous and arrogant like position, it is. right? It's, it's it is absolutely like, absurd. <laughs> it's absolutely absurd. And you want to say, and I try to say, I find both sides absurd, <clears throat> right? And people go, yes, but yes, you yes, have, like, you have to take a side. And I'm saying, no, no, the way, the way you are saying I have to take a side is exactly the problem I want to challenge, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yes. <clears throat> um, yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh uh yeah yeah i i, I yeah I I, I I i i like where this that this is going um uh, i yeah that the idea you know of getting at the cultural guts in such a way that we get clear like uh, exactly the way we've been doing it together and you've been like guiding us really well you know we we sort of really wrestle with our ontology and our phenomenology and then that leads into sort of a cultural critique, which then would play out in ethical and political behavior. I, yes, I agree. I, yes, yes. That's kind of what I mean by steal, steal the culture. Right. So <clears throat> that, that's great. That um, led very well into the last thing that I was thinking about that, that right. I wanted to discuss. And then after that, of course, uh, I don't know, it could go anywhere. But um, uh, it's, um, well, there's a few questions one is what would it look like to have solved the meaning crisis that's one way to put it but another way a better way perhaps would be to say uh, uh what would a, a community look like um in, in its next stage from yeah. where we are right now so it seems that uh you have amassed a great deal of um uh interest in people and and they are they're participating in different ways and it seems that there is need for some kind of um, critical mass or a phase shift, phase transition yeah. of some kind yeah. to, to bring about a, an organization that could um, 
pool resources and distribute yep. resources in a way that could help the people who are interested in participating um, thrive better more directly so the first step it seems would be or the first um, sort of principle along those lines is that there would be more um, real world um, in person engagement of different yep. kinds more embodied practices with each yep. other and yep. a, another principle would be that it uh, would probably remain uh, decentralized yep and distributed yep. across um, as wide a field as possible and then after that uh this there's, there's a lot of musings that i've had but but nothing um too concrete for, for suggestions at this point yeah i mean uh, so much of my discussions <clears throat> with jordan hall have been like like circling circumambulation around this mm -hmm. uh because the, i mean as i've said to people put on my tombstone neither nostalgia nor utopia i don't want <laughs> like i like i i i, I want to exercise uh, appropriate epistemic humility towards this right um uh, like uh, I, um if this is generally going to be an emergent thing, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta take the relationship to it being a genuinely emergent thing. Like it can't be really heavily top down, is what I'm saying. Um, there can be, there can be helpful top down theory, but I don't think there should be a lot of heavy top down governance. Um, what are the things I'm trying to do? Um, you know, I'm working. You know, do the series with Layman Pascal and, and uh, uh, Brendan Graham Dempsey about the artful scaling up the artful scaling of the religion that's not a religion and what like what might art look like and how might we socially organize this i'm working i forgot nathan's last name i'm working he was just on he was with me with uh, edmund Reutsch and cheryl uh, we, we just did, did the empathy circling but anyways nathan and i are working i'm sorry nathan i forgot your last name uh we're working uh together and he's taking the lead on it on you know trying to get these communities these emerging communities of these emerging ecologies and practices to talk to each other um to support to try to get a community of communities going uh, to get you know conferences in the in the real sense of the word and workshops um, interactions going um and so one hand you know with with brendan and layman trying to you know the idea of sort of uh you know uh a multi-institution right that was analogous to like what the the, the university the church and the monastery did and the, the way they're self-correcting with each other and then uh new way new art forms for the generation the ongoing evolving generation of the sacred we explore that so there's that and then there's the 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 actual you know working with communities and then working with the communities of the community this is becoming a bigger part, bigger and bigger part of my work, by the way, of trying to get <clears throat> that organization going in a way that is different from um, sort of Iron Age hierarchies and not committed to spirituality with a sort of a two worlds mythology. Mm -hmm. And right. Um, so that's a very long uh, winded way of saying I take the problem seriously and I'm putting a lot of work into it, but I, I don't know if I have, I mean, I don't know if I have, or if I should have, I'm not quite sure what my ethical obligations are here, my epistemic obligations. I don't know if I have too much more to say about it than that mm -hmm. right now, right? right. It right. is very big. Uh, yeah. I, uh, my approach to this issue has mostly been from a kind of systems theoretical vantage point because yeah. I'm interested in how systems organize and evolve and I'm just, trying to imagine like what would be needed from where I can see the community is at right now uh, in order to bring it somewhere further along its evolution. And uh, uh, how might this look in terms of creating a, a kind of new community that does exist like 50% in a virtual space um, and, and is decentralized into, um, uh, you know, how could such a new culture come about? I, I've really appreciated your conversations um, on the artful scaling of religion. It's not a religion. I, I like that. That's that's given me a great deal of food for thought. Uh, it, it seems that um, uh, some sort of uh, another wave of surrealism would be uh, helpful along those lines. And uh, many integrated training programs, it seems. Um, it's a, people with lots of different skills, um, physical and artistic and academic, uh, all yeah. uh, uh, sort of trading and giving each other um, trainings. Um, 
you know, some sort of organization that facilitates that would be very good. The ultimate end that I've been interested in has been to uh, reinvent the academy, sort of turn the current academy on its head, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the, the only concrete step toward that end that I've come up with is um, some sort of journal that could be made um, that within uh, this this community that could actually um, help. Yeah, it, I think it that's an excellent that idea. It would require a kind of uh, uh, a rigorous academic component as well um, okay. uh, to facilitate it, it, the meaning making endeavors. Uh, and uh, so I've imagined um, a way that a journal could be organized that would be different from other journals, right? Where uh, and um, the 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 wiki that has been started uh, gave me yeah. some ideas for kind yeah. of yeah. ground level, right? So you start with entries uh, that are um, basically a, a kind of glossary of uh, concepts and terms and people that are relevant for the philosophical vantage point. Yeah, yes. uh, and then on another level, you have um, more like articles that are continually being rewritten by yep. Um, yep. potentially lots of people that, that are sort of the core, uh, the founding positions, um, the theories within the, the, the paradigm, you might say. And, and then on another level, you have um, dialectical discourse going on yep, that yep, is assessing yep. the relationship between the different theories because um <laughs> yeah exactly. it's it's given me it's led me to a state of great passion to see that there are um, disagreements that aren't being explicated um as well as they could be and have been in comparison to like other philosophical movements and um it seems that uh, the the kind of discussions that are going on in virtual spaces here uh they're, they're really good in, in that um, they're doing something that a lot of other philosophical movements did not do, um, which is to, to make it much more organic and immediate yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and connected to a wider audience um, so that a wider group of people can actually see the evolution of the ideas. But yeah. at the same time, I think that we could make use of the, um, the software and you know, virtual spaces that we have access to. Um, to really make the movement itself, the, the philosophical evolution um, of the, the positions, the theories, um, sort of uh, self-referential in this way. Yeah. Right? So that yeah. people can see the, yeah. the, the movements that are going on and um, yeah. it can be condensed in, in a solid central space of some kind. Yeah. yeah. I agree with that. I think that's right. Um, yeah, and that's very much a, sort of, it's very much in line with, the stuff that Brendan and Lehman are talking about, about a kind of collective generation of evolving art um, that is in, right, that's in, that's in resonance with, you know, dialogical practices, and they're mutually informing each other. And then we could have like that, like what you're talking about here, um, where there's a self-reflective component about that. Um, yeah, and where people can bring sort of the, the best, broadly construed sort of cognitive science to bear uh, on this. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think that's very good. I mean, the, the things I know I, that it shouldn't be is, and this is why I'm hesitant to be too top down is I'm not founding a religion and, and I refuse, right? That job and I refuse to be labeled. That's what I'm trying, that's not, right? And that's not gonna be the answer. I'm also really influenced, I'm really interested right now. It's just, I'm reading, uh, I think, uh, I can't pronounce this plant's book on a lost ways to the good. And he's talking about, you know, uh, the Silk Road uh, is part of the uh, right, and how the the Silk Road worked, and it didn't work by everybody agreeing. But there was he 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 made an argument that there there's this this framework uh, that became sort of the conceptual philosophical lingua franca, uh, a version of Neoplatonism, and he actually compares pseudo Dionysus uh, to the founder of Shinran of, of, of Pure Land Buddhism, and he, he gets this stuff going, and he says, "Look, I can get see how I can get the two poles talking," and he. He's, he's trying to make, right? And, and I've been thinking about that. Uh, uh, I want to be very clear that I'm not misunderstood in a few seconds, but um, you know, the, the fact that Neoplatonism was able to enter into re reciprocal reconstruction with Christianity, with, with Islam, uh, <clears throat> uh, with Judaism, and now, you know, uh, and, and even in the Kyoto school with, with Buddhism. Um, and, and it's like, and again, I'm not nostalgic, but I'm saying something like that. And, you know, I think we're trying to craft it here. Can we get a phenomenological, ontological, you know, dojo <laughs> in which we can come in and we don't have to come to agreement, but we can come together into real uh, communicative relation. Um, 
And so I've been looking very carefully at, at, uh, at the sort of Silk Road and, and, and this kind of extended Neoplatonism that served as the, the, the it, 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 it performed the same function for, for mines that the road performed for, for trade goods. It allowed, mm -hmm. it, right, it, it gave a through line. And again, uh, he, he's basically uh, saying, we, he's proposing we need to try and find something like that. Um, this is why I've been also, and this connected to the, all the stuff I've been doing about eidetic adduction, right? Mm -hmm. Right, about tr trying to find through lines, which is not the same thing <clears throat> as finding conclusions or finding mm -hmm. agreement, but can we find through lines uh, between you and me? Uh, um, so that's all very vague and promissory, but that's, mm -hmm. that's me trying to get at, like we did this before. This That was globalism round one. And many people have argued that the Silk Road is the first version of globalism. And mm -hmm. they had something very different than what we had. They had the Silk Road, both physical and metaphysical, if I can put it that way, uh, without having homogenous agreement or totalitarian mm -hmm. control or anything like that. So I'm trying to learn what I can from that historical template. So it might be that the overarching framework that serves as a trajectory guide is whatever allows for the best uh, uh, synthesis and um, uh, identification of hom homologies between yes, perspectives. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so that's that's what facilitates. That's what creates the synthesis. Basically, is the is homologies, and and they're being systematized, uh, and that systemized systematized result is being shared for um, a wider audience or for whoever, whomever the participants are. Yeah. Um, to actually see what the relationships are between perspectives. Um, so. It, it, that's a, that's a sense in which uh, you could apply a kind of um, function of a horizon to discussions yep. in a way. <laughs> so <laughs> way to put it, but uh, yeah, no, I think that's right. Hmm. Uh, I mean, and your work is doing that to a significant that's degree. Something too, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very and, and, ambitious. And, and Plant's argument is that um, the Neoplatonism framework on the uh, on the Silk Road did that. It was kind of like a like this is what I'm understanding. It was like a, 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 a psychotechnology or bags, or actually a set of psychotechnologies for doing exactly that in a significant way so that, you know, the Eastern and the Western Christian could talk to each other and they could talk to mm -hmm. the Muslim who could talk to the Buddhist, right? And like getting that, um, mm -hmm. and where the talking isn't just polite liberal tolerance, right. but genuine co-emergence. Both people mm -hmm. get to a place they couldn't get to on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out what, like, what was in that. So, you know, I'm trying to figure out, like, what current people that I respect, like you are doing to try to do that. I'm trying to look at historical examples. And I'm trying to, like, mm -hmm. what, what can we glean? What can we glean from this? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's very much a work in progress, of course. <laughs> yes, very, yeah, um, I'm interested in, in principle, what it even looks like and what the components are I'm trying to work that out. And yes, it's very good to have examples as well that, of, of when it seems to have occurred um, yeah. fairly well. And so the Silk Road, I hadn't ever thought of that before. That's that's really cool. Yep. Yeah, well, I, I like I said, I've largely got that from Plant. I, I had got that argument and I had been sort of independent from him getting what this idea of Neoplatonism seems to have this enormous capacity for reciprocal reconstruction with mm -hmm. other systems. And there, and I thought, oh, wow, that's kind of a, a, a nodal capacity, right? A mm -hmm. nexus capacity. And then he made this historical argument and they just sort of came together. So right now I'm sort of like, oh, that's, that, that's very, very interesting. Yeah. James, I'd like to wrap it up. And I, you know, you and I are going to talk again. So I'm already extending another invitation because this has been wonderful and fruitful. I really, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to let everybody know that you know, uh, James ha bears a lot of responsibility uh, for this uh, conversation uh, because he, he basically sent me this wonderful email laying out the topics and, and explicating them. And they act like they acted like a really fantastic backbone uh, to build the dialogue on. So I want, I want to thank you for doing that, James. And uh, uh, I hope we can do it again in the not too uh, distant future. Um, I'm going to ask James, he's done it before. We did it in the first video to you know, send me the link uh, to his, uh, uh, you know, his current book and any other work that he might want people to 
reflect upon. Uh, maybe you have some videos uh, or anything like that, but uh, I encourage you all uh, to uh, pay more attention to the work of James Schofield. I think he, well, I think this, this, the previous one was good, but I think this one is even better. This is really clear demonstration of the value and the pertinence uh, of James's work uh, to awakening from the meeting crisis. So thank you very much, James. Uh, I'll give you a chance for any final uh, word you might want to say, and then I'll close it down for us. Oh, uh, yes, I also enjoyed this very much. I look forward to uh, talking with you again. Thank you for having me. Uh, I appreciated it a lot. Great. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention.